Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. Hope you guys are all having a wonderful day and I hope you had a Merry Christmas and I hope you have a wonderful new year. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the disappearance of 32 year old Patty Vaughan. She disappeared on Christmas Day in 1996. Patty was born on the 17th of August in 1964 to Patsy Wallace and Billy Brightwell. And a few years after she graduated Kaboski High School in Okinawa, she met a guy named Jerry Ray Vaughan who went by JR. And and in May of 1985, when Patty was 21, they got married in San Antonio in Texas. Between 1986 and 1990, Patty and JR moved around a little bit to Portland, Georgia, and Virginia because of JR's work. He worked in construction. And during that time, Patty gave birth to their three children, a daughter named Brittany and two sons named Ray and Kyla, who by 1996 were nine, eight, and six respectively. In December of 1990, the family settled down in Lavernia in Texas which is a tiny little town with a population of less than 1500 people and it's about 25 miles east of San Antonio and the family lived in a house on Oak Park Road. By the time they settled down there Patty was a stay-at-home mom at JR's request. He wanted her to be at home with the kids so that they didn't have to go to daycare and Patty was a devout Christian. She sang in her church choir. She loved singing ever since she was a little girl and she was known to be a really beautiful singer too and you know they had this really happy suburban life they had three beautiful kids who Patty just adored her kids were her entire world and she would do anything for them she did everything that she could to give them a happy childhood her younger sister Jeannie came to live with Patty and her family at one point I'm just gonna read you a quick quote of what Jeannie said about her time there she said she was the kind of mother who did everything for her children she she made them clothes, she made curtains for the house, she did everything, even for me. She was like a second mom. So Patty was just kind of a natural caregiver, even from a very young age, you know, she would look after her sisters, she was just a very nurturing woman. Now, despite how things looked from the outside, like they had this beautiful, happy suburban life, great family, beautiful kids, things for the Vaughan family weren't all they were cracked up to be. Like over the course of their 11 year marriage, JR was said to be pretty controlling. Like, he didn't let Patty work. As I mentioned, he made her stay home with the children. He was known to make some pretty demeaning comments and apparently he was also physically abusive uh, according to Patty's friends and family, although no official complaints about this were ever made. But some of Patty's family members had said that one time JR threw a glass jar of mayo at a wall in anger and recently leading up to her disappearance, they had seen like some suspicious bruises on her and Patty's family just didn't not like this guy you know he was bad news they did not think that they should be together they knew that Patty was not happy in her marriage and apparently after they separated and JR moved out Patty was like visibly happier she went and got a job she worked at a local electric company called Quinny Electric which was near her house and then about a month after they separated she also got a new boyfriend she met this guy named Gary and he was actually an old flame they had dated back when they were teens before Patty and JR had gotten married and the only reason that they had separated is because Gary's ex-girlfriend from before he started dating Patty got in contact with him and was like yeah I'm actually pregnant and Gary thought he better do the right thing so he left Patty he went and married his ex-girlfriend who he was having the baby with and then by the time that Patty and JR had split Gary had actually divorced his wife as well so Patty was like you know it's meant to be it's perfect timing they were both single and ready to mingle and so they started dating again and Patty's family didn't really know Gary all that much but they just knew that Patty was so much happier with him that she was so much happier since her and JR had separated and they were super supportive of the relationship and of her being with Gary unfortunately though not everyone was quite as supportive of Patty's new relationship as I mentioned she was a devout Christian and one day on the 13th of December she was out at the local Dairy Queen with Gary you know just getting a bite to eat and this guy from her church saw them and this little grade A douchebag went and told the minister of the church even though this little douchebag knew that Patty and JR had separated the minister also knew that Patty and JR had separated but then that night at choir practice the minister comes up to Patty in front of everyone right and he goes 
you don't deserve to represent the church and you don't deserve to represent the choir after your behavior. And Patty was obviously just mortified because he had said this in front of everybody. And she was super upset too because, you know, she loved singing, she loved being part of the choir, she loved representing her church, and it was just a really shitty thing to do. But thankfully, Patty didn't let it affect her relationship with Gary, and she actually brought him to Christmas Eve dinner with her family so that he could meet everybody for the first time. And he got Patty a heart shaped pendant for Christmas, and apparently it was just a really good night. Everyone got along really well, everyone really liked. Gary and it was just a good night full of love and happiness. But then things went downhill very quickly on Christmas Day. So the plan for Christmas was JR was going to come to the house on Oak Park Road so that he could be with the kids and they could exchange presents, they were going to have lunch together and they were trying to make the separation as easy as possible on the kids and then Patty was going to take the kids to her sister Kathy's house for a big family Christmas dinner. But unfortunately Patty never made it to dinner. Her family called her home phone and JR answered and he said that Patty wasn't there, that they had been arguing all day and she had stormed off and left at 6.30 p.m. to go and see Gary and she hadn't returned home. And her family was like, what the heck? Because there's no way Patty would leave her children on Christmas day. And there's no way she wouldn't call to tell them that she wasn't coming. Like, if anything, she would most likely go to the Christmas dinner to feel better and be around family and her children and you know a whole lot of love. The next morning on the 26th of December no one from her family had heard from her. They still couldn't get in contact with her so they contacted Gary to see if she was with him and he hadn't seen her, he hadn't heard from her and so he was freaking out now too because obviously something was wrong enough for her family to contact him. So that morning one of Patty's cousins went down to the Bear County Sheriff's Department and tried to file a missing persons report but the sheriff's department was like, well, you know, she's an adult, she can do what she wants, you know, we can't actually file a missing persons report until she's been missing for 72 hours. And then at 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, so December 26, Patty's 1991 light blue Dodge Caravan was found abandoned on the side of the road off Texas State Highway, Loop 1604, which was about 15 miles from her home and about five miles from her work. And it was actually her boss who found the car. He had driven to work that morning and he hadn't seen the car on his way to work. And then that afternoon he was heading home and he was gonna go run a few errands. And that is when he found her car on the side of the road. And Patty hadn't been at work that day and she wasn't at the car, so her boss was obviously concerned. She hadn't been at work. Now he's just discovered her abandoned car at the side of the road. Like something was very odd about the whole thing. So he called 911. And when the police arrived, they find that the front left tire of the car is flat and the engine is still hot and the inside of the car is like unusually clean. Patty has three kids and you know she lets them be kids so there's usually wrappers and debris and toys and stains on the car seats but the car was spotless and it had actually been shampooed and it was still wet from being shampooed and in fact in the cup holders there was still like water pooled inside them from the car having been washed. Patty's purse and her keys were never recovered and inside the car they also found some men's clothes. There was like this red jumpsuit which had the initials JM on the back and it was like a mechanic or a plumber's work uniform or something and nobody knew who it belonged to. So investigators dust the car for prints and DNA and that sort of thing. The car had been totally wiped of prints, including Patty's prints, but they did manage to find one full set of prints that hadn't been wiped. And they also found traces of blood in the back seat and on the sliding door. So at this point, it was looking like Patty had gotten a flat tire and pulled over to the side of the road. And from there, maybe someone had abducted her. But there was a lot of things wrong with this theory. It didn't really make a lot of sense because one, her boss on the way into work didn't see the car there, but he found it on his way home from work. So unless someone was gonna abduct her in broad daylight, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Second of all, the flat tire didn't have any puncture wounds. It didn't have any, you know, scratches or scuff marks or anything. So it looked like it had actually been intentionally deflated. So they ran some tests and lo and behold it had been intentionally 
freshly deflated. They even took it in and filled the tire up completely and it didn't deflate. So if something had caused her to like blow a tire, obviously it wouldn't be able to hold air again. So someone had gone and unscrewed the cap and let the air deflate from the tire and then put it back on to obviously stage it to look like it had been, you know, Patty had pulled over from a flat tire. There were also no signs of a struggle. There was no disturbed dirt. There was no drag marks or anything like that. And Patty was definitely the type of person who would have put up a fight. So if she had gotten a flat tire and pulled over and someone had abducted her from there, there would definitely be signs of a struggle. The driver's seat of the car had also been pushed all the way back. So it wasn't in the usual position that Patty would drive it in. So it definitely looked like somebody had maybe done something to Patty, hence why the car had been shampooed, why there were traces of blood found in the car and why none of Patty's personal effects were found in the car. And then they had gone and staged the car, let out a little bit of air. So it kind of just would throw police off the scent a little bit, try and make it look like she had just blown a tire. So while investigators sent off the fingerprints and the blood and the DNA for testing, they obviously waived the 72 hour waiting period and got started on the investigation. They started with searching the immediate area around where Patty's van was found and they had friends and family helping, they had officers helping, they had around 500 volunteers helping and Patty's friends and family said that they were actually really scared in this search that they were just going to come across her body. But unfortunately, this search turned up nothing. Investigators also went and questioned friends and family and potential suspects. And they obviously went to question Gary and Gary offered to come down to the police station. He offered to submit to a polygraph test. He was super cooperative the whole time. And he was just, you could tell he was devastated about Patty's disappearance. He helped out all he could. He was there in every single search that they did for Patty. And Patty's family didn't really know him all that well. They only knew him from the Christmas Eve dinner that they had with him but they got to know him a little bit better over the searches because like I said he was always there with them searching he really tried to do everything that he could to help investigators and to help find Patty he also had a solid alibi for Christmas Day and he did unfortunately die just a few years later from a tragic car accident and he was never considered a suspect so like I said investigators also questioned some friends and family of Patty and JR and they found out some pretty interesting things. First of all, one of Patty's sisters called her on Christmas morning and she said that it sounded like Patty had been crying. And when she asked Patty what was wrong, she said that her and JR had been fighting all morning and JR could actually be heard in the background of the phone call telling her to get off the phone. JR's sister Marilyn also, like I think she had like lunch plans with JR and Patty or something. So she headed over to their house at around lunchtime and JR answered the door and he was like, oh, look you should probably go Patty's not really feeling well she's been holed up in the bedroom the whole time and he also asked Marilyn to take their three kids so that they could have some time to try and work out whatever they needed to work out and just have some time to themselves so obviously after hearing all of this investigators went and questioned JR and his story was that he and Patty had gotten into a bit of a fight they had apparently been fighting all day over Gary because apparently Patty wanted to spend more time with her boyfriend than she did with her family and so he asked Marilyn to take the kids so that he and Patty could have some time alone to try and figure things out but they didn't end up figuring things out and at 6 30 p.m. Patty stormed off she drove off in her car to go and see Gary and that was it and apparently JR didn't see her again now a lot of weird things started coming up about JR first of all he never participated in any of the searches for Patty, saying he had to stay home with the kids. Second of all, Barbara went over and dropped some flyers over, some missing person flyers, so that he and the kids could hand these out. And when she went back there a couple days later, these flyers were still in the exact same spot that she had put them. As I mentioned, since the separation in October, he had been living in an apartment in San Antonio. And two days before Patty disappeared, he contacted his landlord and he's like, look, I gotta break my lease because I'm moving somewhere else even though he had nowhere else lined up to move to. I mean maybe he was expecting to like reconcile things with Patty, I don't know, but to make things even shadier, once he came over on Christmas Day to you know visit Patty and the kids, he never had to move out again, he just started living there. And then the day after Patty disappeared on the 26th of December, he went ahead and filed 
for divorce from Patty. I mean, to give him the benefit of the doubt here, like if his story is true and they were fighting about Gary all day and then she stormed out and went to see Gary and then never came home, I mean, maybe he was like pissed off about it and was like, hey, bye, and like filed for divorce. Why is he so open about being shady if he's guilty? Like not searching for her, filing for divorce the day after she disappeared, trying to break his lease two days before she disappeared. I mean, telling everybody that they were fighting about Gary all day. Like if you're guilty, wouldn't you try harder? to not look guilty? <laughs> or is that just me? I mean, in saying that though, I think JR is shady as heck. I mean, he never helped search for her. I mean, you know, even if you pissed at her, you were with this woman for 11 years, surely you would wanna go and help look for her, even if it's just for the sake of the three children you have together and so they have their mum. On top of all of that, if you didn't already think he was shady, a few days after Patty's disappearance, he went ahead and replaced her voice on the voicemail machine to his own. He also refused to submit to a polygraph test. He lawyered up and refused to submit to any fingerprint or DNA testing so that they could compare his DNA with the DNA and the fingerprints found on Patty's car so that they could rule him out. He also refused to let investigators take any DNA samples from the children and he refused to let investigators speak to the children at all, even going as far as to follow the children to their Bible study, wait at the Bible study, to make sure that nobody could come in and try and talk to them. He also didn't allow them to search the house unless they got a warrant. So on the 29th of December, investigators did just that and they got a warrant to search the house. JR's little personal attack dog, his sister Marilyn was there and she was like getting all up in investigators' grills, like asking them a bunch of questions, just being super annoying to the point where she actually had to be escorted out of the property while they were searching. So investigators did a luminol test in the house and they found traces of blood on the floor, the walls and the closet of Patty's master bedroom, in the master bathroom and also in a mop and a mop bucket in the house. And despite this, despite finding traces of blood in the house, they didn't coordinate off as a crime scene and JR and the three kids continued to live there. Like he could have been cleaning stuff, tampering with evidence, removing things he forgot to remove. But anyway, they sent off the blood found in the house for testing and a little while later they got those test results back and the blood found in the house and the blood found in Patty's abandoned car both belong to Patty. So after a few months, on the 10th of February in 1997, after nothing was happening with the investigation, you know, JR was still just living his life, Patty's mum Patsy actually was arrested for breaking into the house and attacking JR with a baseball bat and she was charged with assault and robbery and I actually couldn't find anything as to whether or not she was actually like sent to prison or whether or not those charges were dropped or whatever but you know she was just convinced that JR had something to do with Patty's disappearance and she was pissed that he wasn't being held responsible and I think Patty's family was just feeling super desperate they weren't happy with the investigation at all and JR also managed to get custody of the three children and he he didn't allow them to talk to Patty's family whatsoever. Without a body, it was really difficult to try and build a case against JR, but it was a small town, a lot of rumors were going around, and eventually police got a tip about where Patty's body may be. So at the time of Patty's disappearance, JR was working as a supervisor at the construction of a elementary school in Pleasanton, which is about 40 miles away from Lavernia. And some of JR's employees said that JR had been acting really out of character and he was like insisting on overseeing the pouring of the concrete even though that wasn't actually part of his job. Records showed that the concrete was actually poured on the 21st of December in 1996, so four days before Patty's disappearance, but investigators decided to go and search the school anyway, just in case those records, you know, were falsified. So with JR's consent in May of 1997, they went and searched the school and they used ground penetrating radars, which detected 
did the occasional anomaly under the concrete, but nothing substantial. They used a hole boring machine to dig into the concrete, and then they brought in cadaver dogs to try and detect any methane, which would emit if there was a decomposing body under the concrete, but the dogs never picked up on any smells like that, and there was nothing found at the school. Nine years after Patty's disappearance in 2005, investigators were still no closer to solving the case, so JR went ahead and tried to have her declared legally dead so that he could actually collect her life insurance money, and Patty's parents were like, no way is that happening. They were pissed. So they went ahead and filed a civil, like wrongful death civil lawsuit against him. And so it was declared that Patty's life insurance would be put into a trust fund for her children for when they got older. In 2006, the owner of a piece of property in Pleasanton came forward to authorities and said that around the time of Patty's disappearance, he had noticed that the construction company JR worked for had been digging a pit in that area and they said that they dug this pit to store trash and other sort of debris so investigators went ahead and they got some cadaver dogs in and turns out the cadaver dogs it was almost impossible for them to smell anything because the location of this pit was so close to a cemetery so nothing was found. Patty's family also believed that she may have been buried in the backyard of her former Oak Park Road home. A trash pit was dug in the backyard there there about four months before Patty's disappearance and according to some neighbors apparently on Christmas night they heard the sounds of heavy machinery being used in that backyard. The new owners of the house um, actually didn't allow or didn't give consent to police to search the property until 2014 when they moved out and new owners came in so it wasn't until 2014 that the police did a search but when they did search they didn't find anything. In 2012 they went ahead and did some new DNA tests of some items that were found in Patty's van and they actually found traces of female DNA that didn't belong to Patty, it didn't belong to anybody in her family and one of the investigators said that they believed they knew who this female was but without probable cause they couldn't get a warrant to go and get any of their DNA to test against the DNA, the female DNA that was found in the van. They also said that while JR was the main person of interest they believed that he had accomplices, that he had a couple of people, maybe friends and family, who actually helped cover it up, but nobody else has ever been publicly named. I mean, could this female DNA be from JR's sister? That is immediately where my mind went to, because, I mean, she was described as his, like, little watchdog, especially, like, when the investigators came to search the house, and she was, you know, getting all up in their grill, and he allegedly gave the kids to her on Christmas Day, the day Patty disappeared. Maybe she took the kids because she knew what was going to happen. Maybe she had more to do with it than just taking the kids for the day. But who were the other people that helped out? And what was the motive? I mean, seems to me like maybe he was just jealous of Patty's new relationship. Maybe he wanted the kids all to himself. Patty's family believed that Patty was murdered in her home and her body was then put into her van and driven to wherever her body was dumped. It was then shampooed and cleaned and driven to Texas State Highway Loops. 1604 where they you know unscrewed the lid on the tire let it deflate to kind of throw investigators off and make it look like she had just abandoned the car. A little while after the disappearance JR ended up moving to South Texas which Patty's family was like well that's sketchy because it's really close to the Mexican border and they believe that he moved there just in case something came up and he needed to flee the country and go to Mexico. A few years after that, he moved to Colorado with the kids, changed his name and got remarried. And he eventually got divorced from his second wife too, and then ended up moving to Boise in Idaho. And he never allowed Patty's kids to see or speak to Patty's family. This is a quote from Patty's sister, Janine. She said, it's just devastating to lose my sister and to lose those children. They were like my siblings. We just want this nightmare to be over and more than justice, we just want to be able to lay her to rest. We want to be at peace. But the kids are older now. They would be like at least in their 30s and they've still never reached out 
out to Patty's family. I don't know if maybe JR fed them some lies and so they think badly about them or if maybe just because they were so young when they were kind of cut off from Patty's family they just feel a bit uncomfortable reaching out which is totally understandable. I mean they've been through so much losing their mum. But that is everything from me today. That's everything for this case. As always I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you guys think about this one? Do you think that JR had something to do with Patty's disappearance. Personally, oh, I think yes. But it is weird that like, if you're guilty, why do you act so guilty? Like he acted guilty. Is it like a hiding in plain sight type of thing or what? Like it was just odd behavior. Like if you were guilty, surely you would try and act less guilty. But no, 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 not JR. But that's it. That's everything for this video. That's all from me today, guys. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. What do you think? Do you think JR had something to do with her disappearance? Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the year. I hope you have a happy new year and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye, guys.